Now, given everything that I've said in introduction of you, um, is there something that we might not know about you? Let's see. Um, I was born and raised in Alaska. Ooh. That's right. I have a cabin, my dad has a cabin, <laughs> on a lake wow. that you could only get to by flying there. Um, and I think we're going to maybe see a picture in a second of my family at the cabin. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you probably didn't know that about me. Yeah. Oh, there we yeah, go. There's yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. May I? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. You, you might. Yeah. So um, you can see me there. My son, well, I'll start here. Daniel is um, 22, recently married. Victoria, sorry, is 20, not married. <laughs> and all of you guys just stay away, okay? <laughs> Um, and then myself, and then Caleb is a 24-year-old seminary student. Wow. He's single. If any of you gals want to talk to me, <laughs> he's a fine, <laughs> fine young man. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Okay, one last one. Sure. Um, g given that you wrote the book, The Gospel and the Mind, could you tell us a little bit more about what inspired you to actually write the book? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do this in the talk a bit, but the, the bottom line is, um, well, a couple things. We started a Christian school called Augustine School, and I'll probably share a bit about that throughout the five talks. But then just looking at the, the dominant culture and the confusion about thinking, the life of the mind, the possibility of knowledge yeah. um, amongst more secular dominant culture... So in trying to start the school, we were just trying to figure out, is there a particularly evangelical, Protestant, gospel-centered way to think about knowing, learning the mind? And so I kind of looked around there and didn't see the book I liked, so I tried to write one. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, pretty adventurous. Okay. Um, the stage is all yours. All right. Thank you, brother. Good yeah. to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Let me get set up here real quickly. It's good to see you all. Let me just get organized here. I may not even need my computer, but let me get it here in case we decide to do this. All right. And that is starting. It is, uh, yeah, first talk here in Malaysia, 23. Well, it is great to be back. I was here in 18, um, four and a half years ago. And to be honest, I, I, was, I was really amazed at the ministry, and I went home and for a long time bored many of my friends talking about how impressed I was with the ministry, just the zeal and the passion. Um, I just loved it. And so I was really thrilled when uh, uh, Robin called me or emailed me and asked if I would come back um, again. You've got something very blessed and beautiful here, something I did not grow up with in Alaska and then in college in Louisiana, seminary in Kentucky, and da 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 So this is not something I experienced as a young Christian, so it's really quite an honor to, um, to be here. And so greetings from my family, um, and they are praying for us and have been praying for us, and I got a note from my dean, who's also been my pastor, that our church in Jackson, Tennessee was praying for us. So know that folks in the, the U.S. love the church here in Malaysia and Southeast Asia and want to see the church prosper here. So um, I am thrilled to be here. Let me pray for us, please, okay? Father, we give thanks that we can gather and um, spend time thinking about a very uh, important set of issues and thinking about the relationship between the gospel and the way we think and the, the gospel and our intellectual life, this the gospel and the mind. Help us to grasp both the gospel, what it means to think, and the relationship between the two. Um, I pray you would help me to speak what is true, and if things I say are false, you'd make them to no effect, and if things I say are true, you'd drive those home deep into our hearts, and we might be changed persons because of our time together. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's the plan. Um, the, the book is um, six chapters, five talks. What I've done 
is after talking to a number of folks, Robin and others, um, the first talk is just going to be big picture overview. Really, I'm going to try to give you a biblical theology of knowledge. That's a, a second a follow-up book I'm working on, kind of Gospel of the Mind 2.0, kind of, because um, I think it's a very important issue. Uh, I was talking to Robin. I said, this is, some of this is kind of heady stuff. He goes, Brad, don't underestimate us. This is a great group. He said, just talk and talk and talk and go for it. So if you've listened to Robin, he knows how to talk and talk and talk. And um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to try to imitate or channel Robin as I'm here um, to uh, uh, this, uh, these few days. But the first talk will be an overview of what we're going to do. Then we'll dive into some detailed things in this talk two through five. I do want to save some time at the end for for Q&A. So if I stop for Q&A, are y'all going to speak up and ask questions? Are you going to engage? I'm just going to start calling. I know Jerome's name, so I'm going to start calling on Jerome. I know there's some Joel's. I <laughs> met I met some Sa- Sam. Anyway, so I'm going to start calling on you if you don't uh, if you don't speak up, okay? So, but let's uh, let's jump in. The um, the title the gospel and the mind. Um, some of this talk, I will every now and then refer to Western culture. And I talked to my host and said, well, should I do that? And so when I say Western culture, I'm not trying to be, um, um, I th- I'm not trying to be what, an orang puti? Is that the word? Orang? Orang puti. Okay. I am one, but I'm going to try not to be one in a rude way, but my hunch is that I'm no expert on Malaysian culture. Just ask my host. Last night we had a hot pot, and before they explained what is happening, I sat there like a deer in the headlights trying to figure out what, what we were doing. Was I going to eat all this meat before it got cooked? But we, they said, no, just throw it in the boiling, watery uh, uh, stuff, and uh, it was awesome. So I, I'm not an expert on your culture, but my hunch is that the problems that plague what we might call Western culture are probably at least have an echo here, given the internet, given the homogenization of modern culture in many ways. So I I do not mean to offend, sorry if I do, but I have a hunch there's enough echoes and analogs in our different worlds that what I uh, have to say will make make some sense. Um, I want to start... and so we can go to slide two there. Um, I don't think I got a clicker before I came. Ah, you got it. You got it. And where do I point this? Do I point it in the back? When I point it back there when I do it? Yes. Yeah, back there. Yep. Okay, so let's see. So can you all see this uh, fancy drawing? Okay. So right there. Okay. So pre- look here. Point there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, a lot of coordination for you. And I point uh, right yeah. there. Back, back right. and forward. This is I got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Whew. We'll see. Um, <laughs> so I've got a nice little emblem in there. So when the, when the gospel goes into a culture, let's say it goes into an unbelieving culture, in, in general, unbelieving, non evangelized culture. What, what institutions would you say maybe pop up when the gospel goes into a culture? Schools, yeah, very good. So you beat me to that one. Yeah, very good. Okay, so we'll see how this goes. Let's go to the next slide or the next hit, hit, boom or whatever. Uh, if you all can do that for me, okay. Keep going. Is it go? Is there? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So churches. Then the next one. Okay. Keep going. Schools. Next one. Hospitals. Medical. Now I gave this talk recently, and someone said I should put in government. Now, that's actually a good point, but I already had made the slides. We're sticking with this. Churches, schools, and learning, and hospitals, medical. Now what we're going to concentrate today is on on this, this, the second one there, on the way that wherever the gospel goes, the, let's see if, this, if I'm working it, 
it's working good. Wherever the cross is planted, the academy follows. And so that's the observation that these five talks will work through. And then the question is going to be, let's see if we can kind of keep going there. Why? The question is, why is it that wherever the gospel goes, the academy follows? Okay? Now, that's, that's why I wrote the book. Okay? Now, the, the, cultural, the cultural backdrop, now this book came out in 2010, um, the cultural backdrop, which we're still experiencing today, is that Christianity... Christianity is considered by many to be hostile to reason or thinking, to the intellectual life, to the life of the mind. So many think that Christianity in its very nature is hostile to the intellectual life. Okay, And so we as Christians, sometimes maybe with good reason, can be called anti-intellectual. And we do have that uh, tendency at times, or that we can, we can do that at times. One of the glories of studying church history is you quickly discover that all throughout 2,000 years of church history, Christians have been at the forefront, often, not always, about serious intellectual, theological, scientific, philosophical engagement and advancement, okay? So that's why the slide, I won't start going back, that's why wherever the, go wherever the gospel goes, the academy follows. The gospel goes into a city, a culture, a country, a region, and schools start popping up. And what I want to discover is why that is the case. But just a quick cultural sidebar, our current setting is one in which uh, the non-Christian world, at times at least, thinks Christians are inherently anti-intellectual. So if we can go to the slide with the video, please. Um, we're going to play a slide. I'm going to play a slide from the Bill Mayer show. Is that popping? He isn't traditionally Christian, and yep. we're a nation of heretics. And the bad news is that everything that you hate, that you really hate about religion, is embodied by the faiths that have risen as institutional Christianity has declined. So, you know, prosperity preachers, Joel Osteen, self-help gurus, Deepak. the Deepak Chopra, and so on. Yeah. So this, so, so this is, it's, in a way, right. it's bad you, news for both of us. You, you say, that, no, that you criticize both sides. You say the right, uh, Listen they here. hurt religion because they've made it anti-intellectual, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think... But isn't all religion... I'm not insulting here. I'm no, just saying. No, no, you're just describing. No, it, it I is understand. By its very nature, anti-intellectual. Well, let me let me give. Well, I mean, well, let me let me give you an example, right? So, I think a person. All right. So, um, let me go to the next slide, just in case you didn't capture the picture the uh, the um, dialogue here. All right. So, uh, Bill. Bill Mayer says, when you get 57, you need these things called glasses. There we go. Now, you criticize, this is uh, Mayer, yeah. Now, you criticize both sides. You say the right, they have hurt religion because they have made it anti-intellectual, right? And then Ross, I think it's do, do that is his name, or do that. He, he says, and he's actually a conservative Catholic. I'm not promoting Catholicism here, but just to give credit where credit's due. He's a conservative Catholic going on the Bill Mayer show in the States. D Duthat says, yeah, I mean, I think, and then Mayer interrupting Duthat says, but isn't religion, I'm not insulting here, oh no, it's not me, you're just describing. It, it is, by its very nature, anti-intellectual. And then did you hear the audience all start to applaud? Okay, now, that's New York City, and, and so New York City is, is, is like, like many large U.S. cities, radically sexual, secular, so c'est la vie, that's just the way it is. But that's the, um, that's the environment, I suspect you have echoes of that in Malaysia, I don't know, but it's certainly the dom a dominant Western trend is to see 
Christianity is inherently anti-intellectual. And let me just say, we're going to get to the Bible stuff here, so I'm not just, not just going to be a theology philosophy lecture. We're getting there. But, um, but I want to just, um, let's go to the next couple slides here. Oh, oh, sorry. Yep, yep. Go back one. Yep. So what I want to do, I want to give you a graph or a picture because what, what's happening for many of us, many of you I suspect, is what's called cognitive dissonance. Okay, cognitive dissonance is where if I move around like this, am I getting in anyone's way, Robin? Or if, if, okay, just ru- go go around. Okay, um, is you and I your experience is called cognitive dissonance? So you're here with Bradley Green and all the rest, and we're doing theological evangelical stuff together. Okay. And then as soon as you go on your phone, if you you get bored with me and you start checking Facebook, Instagram, whatever, you're getting bombarded by a a different set of cognitive or intellectual stuff. And you're undergoing what's called cognitive dissonance. You may not always feel it or experience or whatever, but particularly if you're a newer Christian, and you've come to faith maybe more recently, or you've not matured as much yet, you, you, you've come to Christ, praise the Lord, and now you're, you're, you're hearing good preaching, I hope, wherever you're going to church, GTF, etc., and you're hearing good stuff in those settings, I hope and pray, but then you're hearing the same old stuff by the dominant culture. So you've got this battle going on in your head, okay? And... And so you've, you've, in, you've, you've imbibed something from the dominant culture, even if you don't know it. So, so J.R. Tolkien could say, education is one act of repentance after another. <laughs> in other words, when you're learning, when you're learning and you're, getting, you're becoming educated, it's, it's like repentance because you've, been, you've absorbed certain things from the dominant culture naturalism, narcissism, whatever. And then you're having to repent of that and to change your mind as you get exposed to Christian biblical theological realities. Okay, am I making sense thus far? I don't want to lose you in the first 10 minutes. How am I doing? How, how, yeah, okay, yeah. How am I doing? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Right? If, if anyone wants to be honest and say, I don't understand a word you've said, just say that to me, okay? All right. So I want to give you a little chart. So thank you. Yeah. So if this helps you just a little bit to think about cognitive dissonance and, and what it's like to grow up in a contemporary secular culture. So here's one way to think about this, okay? This is not unique to me. This is you're just basic Christian theology, philosophy stuff. So one way to think about this is in the left-hand column. Now, this is not what I'm saying. How this, I'm not saying this is the way things should be. I'm saying this is often the way the dominant culture is informing us as we walk through life as believers, okay? So you've got on, the, on the left column, you've got the faith column. And the dominant culture might tend to say things like, faith goes along with feelings and emotions, religion, unformed opinion, maybe your, even your ethical values. So you've got this realm called faith, and do you notice anything missing in that column? Truth. Mind, okay, all right? Look at the right-hand column. In the reason column, right, you've got things like facts, thinking, science, like being educated, facts, okay? I'm not sure why I repeated those. I must have been really wanting to say the word facts this day when I made this. But you get the point is one of the things we have to do as Christians as we mature is realize thinking God's thoughts after him, developing our minds, learning how to think 
is a subset of discipleship. You with me? Okay. And you've got to destroy this, what we call a dichotomy. Okay. Now, I do not know. Now, just is this simply a Western thing or do you experience this here? I assume you do. Okay. So one of the things I want to do this, 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 this conference, the weekend's not correct, it's Thursday? So Thursday, for going into the weekend, into the week weekend, is help us think out why we should deny the premise. So when you're engaging in debate, one of the things you can do is you deny the premise of the person who's going for the jugular with you, right? And so we're going to spend this week, weekend, denying this premise. Does that make sense? Okay. We're going to say there's a, there's a better way to think about the intellectual life where there is a friendliness between faith and reason, faith and thinking, faith and the mind, between ethical values and facts, between Christian faith and science. I'm not a science. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But I'm going to try to make the case that we need to completely reject this paradigm as Christians. Okay? Sound good? All right. So now what I'd like to do is if we could go to the Word document, um, a basic biblical theology of knowledge, please, and go to that document. And let's see. Oh, look at them. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. Now, we'll see how that, yeah, make it as big as you can. Yep, just keep going down to the cool gray shade of basic biblical theology of knowledge. Okay. And here's what I want to do. This first talk is essentially simply lay out a biblical theology of the life of the mind or a biblical theology of knowledge. Okay. Oh, thank you. Because remember, the watching world is saying that Christianity is anti-intellectual. Okay. And sometimes we are guilty of that, but there's, there's a couple, couple mistakes we can make. We could say, yeah, we should be into anti-intellectual because it's all about faith, right? I hope you've listened to Robin or others preach and you've, you affirm the doctrine of being justified by faith alone. So someone might say, well, if I'm justified by faith alone, maybe the mind stuff and thinking is not that important, okay? So you might think maybe I should embrace anti-intellectualism. It's all about faith. But here's what happens when you do that. You've got this whole other aspect of your life, thinking, reasoning, the life of the mind, etc., which you have then, even if unintentionally, sequestered, at least in your heart and in your mind, not in reality ultimately, but you've sequestered it from the Lordship of Christ because you're not working through how do I relate my schooling, my learning, my thinking from the Lordship of Christ. So what I want to do is lay out today just a this session, a basic biblical theology of knowledge. So let's start with the doctrine of God, okay? So now for some of this, I'm just going to give you scripture references and move on because we'd be here way too long if we preached on the 30 passages I've got outlined here. So I will do some summarizing and simply asserting I've given you some scripture references. We'll go into some of those. But first off, we talk about the biblical doctrine of God, we are saying God is triune and personal, triune and personal, which means that God is relational from all eternity and personal from all eternity. Okay. So that is why we can say God is a God who can be known, because God is a personal God. He is a God who speaks now, in the book, if you read the chapters on the word, on, on the words, those are the most difficult chapters, uh, the, particularly the one on Derrida and all that stuff. So I'm sorry, that's a, that's a, a tough, a tough chapter if, if you get to that chapter. But I would make the case based on texts like John 16:13, that language begins with God, 
that God, Father, Son, Spirit has been communicating in whatever, whatever divine words look like. God has been communicating with himself or the persons with themselves have been communicating from all eternity. The reason we use words is not just because words are simply social constructs. We'll get to all that kind of fancy talk. But because God himself is a wordish God, he's made us his wordish being. God communicates to us because God is a God who knows and can be known. Now, can you see where I'm going to take that probably with the rest of this talk? Since God is a God who can be known, we've got to think about who is God. Is he Trinitarian or not? Is he holy or not? Is he omniscient or not? Maybe, I don't believe this, is God so transcendent he can't be known? Is God so transcendent that we can't understand who he is? Some strands of, I won't get, we'll get into political fighting here with other groups, but some strands of Christianity come close to that. God cannot be spoken of, cannot be known. I think that's a mistake, and I'll, I'm just laying out now the positive side, not the negative side. But God is a triune, personal God who can be known. And so our doctrine of God is going to lead us to affirm some sort of theology of the mind or a theology of knowing. And I'll try to show this all throughout this talk. One scripture, John 17, 3. John 17, 3. This, uh, if I do write this book, I'm thinking of entitling it, uh, This is Eternal Life, and then a subtitle, A Biblical Theology of Knowledge. But look at John 17, 33. And this is eternal life life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, that's important, isn't it? It's not a minor sub-theme of the, the Bible, but Jesus, our Lord, can actually say, eternal life is knowing God, so thus we must be serious about what does it mean to know? What does it mean to have a mind? And why did God give us a mind? Okay? All right. Let's talk about creation for a second. So if you want to scroll down for me, thank you. So on creation, again, I cannot uh, uh, expound on each of these texts right now. I'm just going to assert some things. And I've given you the text. We've got the book. We've got another four talks to get into some of this. But let's think biblically for a second. According to Scripture, the created world is just that. It is created, it is structured, it is governed and sustained, and it is a God-directed reality. Hence, creation in its very nature is something that has inherent meaning and structure. This is why in the history, again, I'm not praising the West or not praising the East, in the history of Western culture, when the Protestant Reformation took root, there was a groundswell of scientific exploration. Why? A couple reasons. The world is an ordered, created thing that can be known. But also, this is interesting, because Protestants had such a strong doctrine of sin... Western scientists thought, we've got to work really hard to know the world. This isn't all the notes. I'm just freelancing on that part, okay? But science is hard work because of sin. Sin affects our mind. We're going to get to that. You must work real hard to know God's world. But the main thing is the world is real. That's why, in the former slide... That's why when the gospel goes into a culture, hospitals, works of mercy emerge. Because what's your name, dear? I'm not going to pick on you. What's that? 
Ezra. That's a good name, Ezra. So let's see. Ezra falls and slips and hurts her leg. Now, are we all going to walk by and ignore Ezra? You better say no, okay? <laughs> of course we're not. Because we believe that suffering's real. Because creation's real. We believe suffering's real. So we're going to come rescue Ezra, okay? So the Christian faith in all sorts of ways, because of its affirmation of creation, encourages intellectual deliberation. Genesis 1.28, what does God do? He speaks to his creation. But even particularly interesting, look at Genesis 2 for a second. Genesis 2. My Bible is falling apart. That's either a sign of being a Bible reader or of being one who doesn't take care of his Bible well enough. Anyway, um, so if, 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 I, if I'm ever preaching and I can't preach on Genesis 6 and 7, that's because it's fallen out and I've photocopied those pages back in here. Uh, but Genesis 2, 16 and 17, you know this passage. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now we're about to get into sin, okay? The knowledge of good, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Right? So even in the created order, there's a prohibition about a certain kind of knowledge. You see this? Knowledge is right there at the beginning of the Bible. We, God reveals himself. He speaks to us. He warns us about a certain kind of knowledge. And then we get, of course, the fall in Genesis 3. So are we tracking on the notes here? Are we doing okay? Yep. Is it all going down? Okay. So the fall section there. Wonderful helpers, okay? Um, in Genesis 3, 6, what is attractive to the woman about the fruit of the tree? The tree is good for food, delight to the eyes, and what? Desired to make one wise. All right. So if we were to do a biblical theology of wisdom, what could we say? We could say from the very beginning of the canon almost, there's a, there's a true wisdom and a false wisdom, right? Because the woman trying to be wise on her own terms is seeking, I think you would have to say, an inappropriate kind of wisdom, right? When the scripture says someone is wise in his own eyes, is it praising the person? Not at all. When 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16, talks about the wise man and the fool. Proverbs, wise and foolish. It's like there's two kinds of wisdom. There's true, biblical, Christ-centered wisdom, and then there's a narcissistic, self-serving, harmful wisdom. You could unpack, I think, in his one sense, all or most of the Bible tracing out true and false wisdom throughout the Bible, right? This is all 1 Corinthians 1, 2, etc. So we won't do all that now. Now, because of this, we have, and so are we at the noetic effects of the fall? Good. So because of this, we have what's called the, we call the noetic effects of the fall. Noetic is from the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S, which just is the Greek word for Mind, okay? So noetic just means having to do with our mind or understanding, okay? Now, what Christianity, particularly the, the reformers, particularly the reformed, uh, were quite consistent on is what we call the noetic effects of the fall. Now, I've got a document on my website where I do a bunch of this. I've just kind of put in this document for teaching today certain things from Proverbs, okay? Certain things from Proverbs on the noetic effects of the fall. But I want you to hear the Proverbs. Proverbs 1.22. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing? Now get this. And fools hate knowledge. 
See, the Bible is a pro-knowledge book. The gospel is pro-knowledge. But what the Bible forces us to do is to construe knowledge in explicitly biblical, theological ways. Proverbs 1, I love this, I love this. Because they, uh, 129 to 31, because they hated knowledge. Right? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. We'll come back to that one. Proverbs 2, 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And earlier in that proverb, it's because you listen, you incline your ear, you hear, etc. Then one of Augustine's favorite proverbs, Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see how the Bible is giving us an explicitly biblical way of thinking about wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 10, 14, the wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. I love it. I love this. Proverbs 12, 1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Oh, what a great text. So I've been having a fun time with Robin Gann's family and his two precious daughters. And one of them is here. Where is his daughter that's here? I'm going to embarrass her right there. So, uh, and so uh, when you, um, do you just love it when your daddy disciplines you? <laughs> yeah, okay, be honest. We don't. Yeah, we always love it. But, you get, but the scripture says this, right? Hope I'm, I'm just playing. I only tease the ones I like. You know that, right? Okay. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof is stupid. Proverbs 18. An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seek, seeks knowledge. I love Proverbs 28.5. Evil men do not understand justice. Isn't that interesting? I don't understand the first thing about Malaysian politics. I know you want to make justice great again and you want to be a great country. That didn't go over that well. Anyway, okay. But you want to um, be a, a just country and the U.S. wants to be a just country. Um, but evil men do not understand justice. Now, so what's, what's happening here? What is the Bible teaching us? That our spiritual states whether we're bowing to the Lordship of Christ or not, has a cognitive effect on how we understand basic things like justice. That makes sense? It's one thing to understand justice, and because of your sin, you're just going to try to be unjust. That's a problem. But the Proverbs here is actually saying, evil men do not even understand Justice. So here's what I, all I'm trying to do here is say this, is that sin affects the life of the mind. And because of sin, we have what, what Irish theologian Stephen Williams calls a cognitive dysfunction. Isn't it interesting? If that's true, that's pretty radical, isn't it? That means your non-Christian friend... Uh, you got to be careful how you say all this, but your non-Christian friend, perhaps in some ways, doesn't understand justice. They've suppressed the knowledge of God and therefore pretend not to know who God is. Okay? Making sense? Okay. I'm going to wait on Romans 1, I think, because it's such a great... No, we're going to look at it right now. No, we're not. We're going to wait. We're going to wait. I'm going to save Romans 1. For... I love it. I love it. I'll, I'll take too long on it. We'll, we'll, we'll still go back to Romans 1 by the end of the conference. But let's t So we've talked about the knowledge, the doctrine of God, creation, fall. Let's talk about knowledge in terms of redemption or conversion. Okay, again, I'm trying to lay out just briefly a biblical... Theology of knowledge. So I'm right there at the redemption, conversion, right under Romans 1. Is that all popping up there? Okay, y'all are doing great back there. Thank you. Thank you. 
And let's just look at one of these texts. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 for a second. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. This is a fascinating text. I don't know about you, if you've done some preaching or Bible teaching, so Jerome or Robin or others who do some preaching, teaching here and there. Uh, sometimes you discover a text and every sermon you preach for six months kind of circles back to that text because you're so excited about it. <laughs> Maybe you need to read some more of the Bible. But for me, I just that I, every sermon I preached for about a year, I suppose, I kept working 2 Corinthians 4 into it. It was so important to me. But I want you to read, let's read together 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. Uh, Therefore, having this ministry, Paul means here new covenant ministry, Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced graceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Now, here, this next four verses is kind of the, the, the nugget I want you to get. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, or the evil one, or Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. So you've got the image of seeing there, but keep listening, of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So persons are blinded by the evil one and therefore cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And there's a reason Paul is so passionate about preaching Christ and not a false gospel. It's embedded in this text. We proclaim, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Now get this next verse. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now, what is Paul saying here? We are, the unbeliever is blinded. We, we could say from other texts, from our own sin, in this text, from the evil one, they cannot see the light of the gospel. Are you ever sharing your gospel, sharing the gospel with a friend, and you just feel like you're beating your head against the wall? It's because you are, in one sense, Right? So what Scripture teaches is us, your unbelieving friend, I know it sounds harsh, but don't, don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger, okay? Romans 5.10, the unbeliever can even be called an enemy of God. I think God still loves them, assuredly, but there's an enemy there as well. There's a hardness of heart. Here, there's slave, Romans 6 and 7, slave of sin. Here, the imagery is they cannot see the light of the gospel. So what do you do when someone can't see the light of the gospel? Well, you keep preaching the gospel, right? A little bit of a paradox there, but we can talk about that. But notice what Paul says in verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge. There's knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're looking at verse 6, whether you have a study Bible or not, or you're just, just you're looking at your computer's Bible, whatever, what is interesting, what is being quoted in verse 6? Anyone got, you know how to use your cross-references, I bet, and someone, um, someone tell me what verse is being quoted or referenced here in verse 6. What's happening in Genesis 1-3? Creation. And we've met, your name again is, well, we've met, your name again, John. All right. So John, since you spoke up, I may have to pick on you. Because I, I now, now I know your name, John. 
John, first row John, okay. So why is Paul, when he's speaking about the necessity of conversion, quoting a creation text? Did Paul not pay attention in Pauline theology course in seminary? That's a bad theologian joke, sorry. Give me a courtesy laugh, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel, I feel better, thank you, okay. Um, why do you think he's quoting a creation text there when he's speaking about conversion? Probably because for Paul, who can say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Paul knows that what is needed to save a sinner is God's creative power. We could put it this way, the very power used to create the world is the power needed to create a Christian. That makes sense? In other words, the reason Paul so so intent about saying, don't preach anything but Christ crucified, is because that is the message which God uses to make a dead person live. It's kind of like if y'all were unbelievers. You, you would almost be like one big room of zombies, right? Someone's going to do a great... I actually have a friend who's written a Christian zombie thing. I'm not recommending it, but anyway. It'd be like y'all are a bunch of zombies. You're kind of the undead, right? And you've got to be made alive. I think that's Paul's imagery here, okay? So again, the very power needed to create the world is the very power that is needed and is used to create a Christian. But my point is, knowledge is bound up with this. Because what happens when you preach Christ? Somehow, God shines in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So all I'm saying here is knowledge is bound up at the beginning. It's bound up in sin. It's it's bound up in our fallen experience with the noetic effects of the fall. But also knowing Christ or knowing the gospel is, is essential to salvation. Okay? Now in the notes there, continuation. All I'm saying here is that what the Bible clearly teaches, we won't look at all these, is that there is a growth in our knowledge in the course of the Christian life, okay? And I'm just going to look at one of these passages, Ephesians 4. So all I'm saying here is once you're converted, the Bible clearly teaches there'll be a kind of continued growth in knowledge, and there's imperatives bound up here. There's commands bound up here. So in Ephesians 4, in Ephesians 4, I'm going to back up to verse 19 to get a running, uh, verse 20 to get a running start, but that is not the way you, I'm going to back up to 17, excuse me. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their, look for it, minds. They are darkened in their understanding. We could have read this text under the, the sin stuff, okay? Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. Notice the Bible is always bringing together heart and head. The problem is one, almost is always linked to a problem in the other. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned. And then it's saying learn to Christ, another kind of mind thinking word, the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self the Greek is better translated man. So I love the ESV, but I wish they would have kept man here. To put off your old self for man, 
which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful, deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. There's a renewal which takes place throughout the Christian life, and it includes a transformation of the mind. And to put on the new cell for man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So for time's sake, let me move on. All I'm saying here is, in the course of the Christian life, you might look up Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, be conformed. Ah, let me read it real quick. It's, it's, it's worth, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, Romans 12 is a classic here as well, where Paul can say in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see the ongoing theme pervasive throughout the Bible? The life of the mind is a subset of the life of discipleship. Lastly, in the notes there, consummation. Thank you. You were there? Yeah. You'll degree up. Thank you. You're all doing great. Thank you. On consummation. This is, I'm going to linger on this in talk three, but let me just introduce it here. What the Bible says at, at several places is that our ultimate destiny, or what, the one way the Bible speaks of where we're going as Christians, is knowing God, even seeing God. Well, we can discuss what that means, but look at 1 Corinthians 13. 12. I'm going to back up to 11 to get a running start. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now get this. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now think about that for a second. Our future destiny as believers is to know fully, I'll talk about that in a second, even as I have been fully known. Because God, of course, already knows me as well as He can. Because we, we tend to say as Christians, God doesn't grow in his knowledge because his knowledge is perfect and complete, etc. But we do grow in knowledge. I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now, my wife and I, a few days ago, celebrated 30 years of marriage. Bless that woman. Bless <laughs> that woman. Um, she is a saint. She's beautiful. Uh, I love her with all my heart, and she's patient with me. Um, and I've been getting to know her for now for 30 plus a couple years. We actually lived in a different city the whole time we were engaged, by the way, which is a great way to avoid misbehaving. So if you, if you get engaged, just move to different cities, right? <laughs> just sanctify yourself and live, you know, four, eight hours apart, okay? Um, and um, I'm only half kidding there, but, um, but I've been getting to know dying for 32 years. I do not need or want a second, third, fourth wife. It's hard enough just to get to know one, right? I mean, she's wonderful, but for 30 plus years, I've been getting to know Diane. And she's still a mystery to me in some ways, right? And she's wonderful, and we have a great marriage. There's, there's no major crises, you know. We're not about to go, you know, have a crisis, you know. Um, all's great, but uh, she's still a mystery. How much more so with God? But Paul can say we shall know fully. I think we have to say something like, we know fully as far as a creature can know the creator of the universe. So probably with these kind of texts, we, 
given the rest of the Bible, we're going to say something like, we know fully and we keep getting to know God more and more and more for all eternity. But you, but you see how this is different from other faiths, other systems? Because what's, we've, looked at a, we've looked at the history of redemption in a sense, right? In one sense, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, think of it as a revelation-y kind of passage, into the, into the storyline kind of passage, okay? One way the Bible speaks of our ultimate destiny is to know God fully. So what, what I'm going to explain on day three is that, or talk three is that, What we're doing now in the course of our lives is, in a sense, preparing for our eternal destiny of continuing to get to know God. We're kind of fumbling around now, aren't we? You're here, I hope, because you want to get to know God better, right? You're listening to an orang petit speak, and I may say something good or whatever, but your ultimate goal is what? Your ultimate goal is to get to know God better. This is kind of like this is kind of like the beginning. We're kind of practicing right now our mind stuff of knowing God because that is what we will be doing for all eternity. Okay? All right. I don't always do this, but any initial questions? Anyone have an initial question I can help with? Anyone thinking, I'm really confused, Brad. You're okay and nice, but I'm confused. You, any, you want to jump in with a question? Go for it. I'm like Captain America. I can do this all day. <laughs> Remember that great line in the movie? It's a great line. Then let me do this. Then we will stop for official Q&A. Um, I want to go to the, um, the Goldsworthy section. Okay, thank you, helpers. Um, I know if you've been in, in Gospel Growth Fellowship, I mean, there's so much of a biblical theology focus, but um, Robin and I both are heavily influenced by Graham Goldsworthy, um, and I still recommend his According to Plan to get started. I use that in a biblical theology course I teach at Union. He's a hero of mine. I really admire and respect uh, Professor Goldsworthy. But his, he has in his, in his book, According to Plan, these five presuppositions of biblical theology. Have you seen these before, maybe? Now, I don't know if you've thought a lot about this, but what Goldsworthy is doing in these five presuppositions is he's sneaking in a Christian epistemology. Okay? Epistemology is a fancy word meaning theory of knowledge. Okay, and I want you to spend a few minutes just thinking about this. What, what Goldsworthy did in his book, According to Plan, is give us a five-point biblical Christian epistemology, and it's brilliant. It's simple. I taught this at Southern Seminary, and I thought they were going to think it was too basic and too whatever, and this one student said, Dr. Green, this is absolute gold. Can you please send me this document, which I did. But it's very basic. So if you're a scholar and you think this is too basic, well, just enjoy it anyway. If it's, too, if it's real basic, then enjoy it. If, if it's hard, then wrap your mind around this, okay? So five presuppositions of biblical theology. Number one, God made every fact in the universe, and he alone can interpret all things and events. And if you've been through this, you know where this is going. He's laying out a biblical Christian epistemology, theory of knowledge. Number two, because we are created in the image of God, we know that we are dependent on God for the truth. He's leading you down the primrose path in a glorious way. So God made all things, he, only He can interpret them. We are image bearers, so our, our knowing is dependent, okay? And if you're, if you're paying attention to our cultural moment, and you've stu- done any study of modernism, the Enlightenment, etc., you know one of the key words for the Enlightenment, modern thought, is 
autonomy, self-ruling. Maybe you've been taught this, right? But what Gold's really pointing out is not really. We're, we know, but we know as creatures dependent on God, the one ultimate knower, we might say. Number three, as sinners... We're going to return to this in another, day, another talk. As sinners, we suppress this knowledge and reinterpret the universe on the assumption that we, not God, give things their meaning. Now, this is, we're going to linger on Romans 1 at length, and it's going to be glorious, I hope. But what Paul says in Romans 1 is God reveals himself to... If you all read Romans 1, I beg you to read it. God reveals himself to all persons, and all persons suppress the knowledge of God. So before we come to Christ, we pretend not to know God, but we do know him. We pretend not to know him, but we do, because God reveals himself efficaciously, 10-cent word, to every person. Number four... Special revelation through God's redemptive word reaching its high point in Jesus Christ is needed to deal with our suppression of the truth and hostility to God. See what he's saying here? Jesus Christ is the ultimate person, reality, truth, which we need to make suppressors of the knowledge of God become unsuppressors, to make the dead person who can't see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ become unsuppressors, okay? Then lastly, number five, a special work of the Holy Spirit brings repentance and faith so that sinners acknowledge the truth which is in Scripture. This is really worth thinking about. When the Holy Spirit comes, and we'll look at 1 Corinthians 2, another session. When the Spirit comes, we are said to have the mind of Christ. That means we need to take knowing seriously. And that the possibility of knowing is not just grounded in creation, but in redemption. And as we're being transformed by the Spirit over time... We are more and more thinking God's thoughts after him as we are being transformed by Christ and his blood being applied to us throughout our Christian pilgrimage. So the Spirit, there's certainly affective senses of the Spirit's work in our lives. So none of us want to be against joy or against gladness or against the, maybe a feeling of freedom we have when we come to Christ. But there's a sober side to it too, isn't there? The Holy Spirit, when, he, when he's applied to us, we have the mind of Christ. We can think God's thoughts after him, okay?